Eliphas Levi was a legendary 19th century occultist who practiced transcendental magic. He was born Alphonse Louis Constant in 1810. He was a sage and a poet who wrote over 20 esoteric books under the pen name of Eliphas Levi. He was born a French Catholic and trained to be a priest, but later was expelled from the seminary for teaching doctrines contrary to those of the Roman Catholic Church. He spent two short terms in jail for writing some rather radical political works during the Revolutionary Period era around 1848. However, after this, he began studying spiritual and esoteric matters in earnest. After Levi discovered European occultism, he learned Hebrew and mastered the study of Hebraic Kabbalah. He never converted to Judaism, but he changed his name to Eliphas Levi because it represented to a certain degree a translation of his two birth names into Hebrew. He started writing about the occult and did so for three decades. He was steeped in the Western occult tradition and a master of the Rosicrucian interpretation of the Kabbalah, which forms the basis of magic as practiced in the West today. Some of his books include The History of Magic, Transcendental Magic, Mysteries of the Kabbalah, and The Doctrine and Ritual of High Magic. Levi viewed transcendental magic as a way to connect science with religion so that they could coexist. He offers his readers guidance as to the ceremonial rituals one must perform in order to make contact with spirits and other non-corporeal entities of the universe. This is called necromancy. Levi said that, quote, to practice magic is to be a quack but to know magic is to be a sage, end quote. In the history of magic, he describes the practice of hermetic magic and says that it is in Egypt that magic attains the grade of completion as a universal science and perfect doctrine. Egypt is described as the science, the cradle of science of wisdom. The basis of this science is an alphabet in which deities are represented by letters. Letters represent ideas, Ideas are convertible into numbers, and numbers are perfect signs. This hieroglyphical alphabet is enshrined in the Kabbalah. Therefore, Levi believes the Kabbalah to be Egyptian in origin. The alphabet is known as the Book of Thoth and preserved in the form of tarot cards. The oracles of the tarot, he states, give answers as exact as mathematics and measured as the harmonies of nature. The answers result from the varied combination of the different signs. Levi knew how to use the most hidden of occult secrets to reach the highest order of the human mind. In his book, The Key of the Mysteries, which was later translated by the infamous Aleister Crowley, he wrote that the secret of these mysteries resides on a higher plane that can only be accessed by reconciling the contradictions found in the dualism of reality. The methods used to accomplish this are the key to these mysteries. Some of the other topics covered in this book are the absolute knowledge of good and evil, why alchemy is the daughter of the Kabbalah, secrets of life and death, the astral world, and the deeper mysteries of religion, religion including the Christian cross. Levi teaches that spiritualism, the tarot, mesmerism, otherwise known as hypnosis, mediumship, magnetic powers, and various forms of magic may all be used to invoke either angels or demons. In Levi's views, the writings of Hermes on the emerald tablet contain all magic in a single page. The legend concerning the emerald tablet is that it was found by Alexander the Great, in the tomb of Hermes, which was hidden by the priests of Egypt in the depths of the great pyramid of Giza. Levi says the most significant of all the writings on the tablet is the statement, that which is above is like that which is below, and that which is below is like that which is above. He names the great medium of occult force, its creative agent, the astral light. One of Levi's major accomplishments was recreating and reinvigorating not only Western interest in the Judaic mysticism of the Kabbalah, but combining it with the powerful symbolism of the Tarot. He thought that there was a close relationship between Tarot and Kabbalah. 
He wrote 22 chapters based on the 22 major arcana of the tarot, matching each to one of the 22 letters of the Hebrew alphabet. As a result of his writings and teachings, tarot became an important tool in divination, occultism, and the practice of Western magic. However, writes Levi, King Charles VII was not intelligent enough to understand how to use the cards and saw them only as playthings. The king turned the mysterious Kabbalistic alphabet into a game of cards. Levi preferred to perform his alleged magic powers within the various secret societies he belonged to rather than in public, even though many wanted to see his rituals. In his book Transcendental Magic, he states that, quote, They asked me forthwith to work wonders, as if I were a charlatan, and I was somewhat discouraged, for to speak frankly, Far from being inclined to initiate others into the mysteries of ceremonial magic, I had myself shrunk all along from its illusions and weariness. Moreover, such ceremonies necessitated an equipment which would be expensive and hard to collect. End quote. During a trip to London in 1854, Levi first attempted necromancy. A woman who was a friend of occultist Bulwer Lytton, who wrote the book The Coming Race, asked Levi to conjure the spirit of a famous magician of ancient times, Apollonius of Tyana. Even though he had never before tried to conjure a spirit, and had even avoided doing so, he consented to the request. An account of the ceremony he performed can be found in Arthur Edward Waite's translation of his work, which is called Transcendental Magic, Its Doctrine and Ritual. So, during a three-week of preparation, which included dieting and fasting, Levi meditated on Apollonius and imagined conversations with him. The ritual of conjuration was performed in a specially prepared temple in which only he took part and consisted of 12 hours of incantations, after which the floor began to shake and a ghostly apparition appeared. Levi admitted to feeling extremely cold and frightened, and when the apparition touched his ritual sword, his arm went suddenly numb. He dropped the sword and fainted. He claimed later that his sword arm was sore and numb for days after the incident. He said that after the ritual, quote, I was no longer the same man. Something of another world had passed into me, end quote. Later on, Levi wrote that performing such rituals of necromancy affected him over time and he warned that such rituals are destructive and dangerous if practiced regularly and not by an experienced adept. Levi is probably best known for his work regarding the alleged deity of the Knights Templar, the Baphomet. According to author Michael Howard, Levi based his depiction of the Baphomet on a gargoyle that appears on a building owned by the Templars. The gargoyle is in the form of a bearded horned figure with pendulous female breasts, wings, and cloven feet. It sits in a cross-legged position which resembles statues of the Celtic stag god Cernunos, or the horned one found in Gaul before the Roman occupation, says Howard. It is also interesting to note that Levi was the first to separate the pentagram into both good and evil applications because he first incorporated his goat-headed Baphomet into the inverted pentagram. This attributed the qualities of evil to the symbol. He said that the effect of rearranging the letters in Baphomet was an abbreviated Latin phrase, T-E-M-O-H-P-A-B. In English, this translates to the father of the temple of peace of all men, a reference to King Solomon's temple, which Levi believed had the sole purpose of bringing peace to the world. The Baphomet figure Levi created has been misunderstood and frequently taken out of context. Nesta H. Webster, author of Secret Societies and Subversive Movements, says this about the symbol, quote, let us declare for the edification of the vulgar and for the greater glory of the church, which has persecuted the Templars, burned the magicians and executed the Freemasons, etc. Let us say boldly and loudly that all the initiates of the occult sciences have adored and always will adore that which is signified by this frightful symbol, the Sabbatic goat. Yes, in our profound conviction, the Grand Masters of the Order of the Templars adored Baphomet and caused him to be adored by their initiates, end quote. 
Well, obviously this interpretation doesn't make a lot of sense when we remember Levi's phrase, the father of the temple of peace of all men. Levi's representation of Baphomet was also misinterpreted by Arthur Edward White, who used it as a model for the devil card of his popular Rider Waite tarot deck. This is why in the eyes of the Western world, the Baphomet represents the Christian devil, the source of all evil. Waite's devil card gave the Baphomet bat wings, a sculling face, and bestial legs and feet. Waite translated Levi's book, Transcendental Magic, into English, but he did not accept Levi's interpretation of the image. By associating Baphomet with the Christian devil, Waite gives the impression that the figure is symbolic of violence, force, and evil. However, if we refer again to the description given above by Levi himself, we can see that Baphomet is conceived of by Levi as a complex symbol of occult science and magic. In chapter 15 of Levi's book, Transcendental Magic, he discusses his Baphomet figure. He says that, quote, we recur once more to that terrible number 15, symbolized in the tarot by a monster throned upon an altar, mitered and horned, having a woman's breasts and the generative organs of a man, a chimera, a malformed sphinx, a synthesis of deformities. Below this figure, we read a frank and simple inscription, the devil. Yes, we confront here that phantom of all terrors, the dragon of the all theogenies, the Araman of the Persians, the Typhon of the Egyptians, the Python of the Greeks, the old serpent of the Hebrews, the fantastic monster, the nightmare, the gargoyle, the great beast of the Middle Ages, and worse than all these, the Baphomet of the Templars, the bearded idol of the alchemist, the obscene deity of Mendez, the goat of the Sabbat. The frontispiece to this ritual reproduces the exact figure of the terrible emperor of night with all his attributes and all his characters. So this description is dark and sinister. Levi is comparing it to the satanic and evil representations of many religions, but he clarifies this interpretation later on in the same chapter when he says, quote, Yes, in our profound conviction, the Grand Masters of the Order of Templars worshipped the Baphomet and caused it to be worshipped by their initiates. Yes, there existed in the past, and there may still be in the present, assemblies which are presided over by this figure, seated on a throne and having a flaming torch between the horns. But the adorers of this sign do not consider, as do we, that it is a representation of the devil. On the contrary, for them, it is that of the god Pan, the god of our modern schools of philosophy, the god of the Alexandrian theurgic school, and of our own mystical Neoplatonists, the god of Lamartine and Victor Cousin, the god of Spinoza and Plato, the god of the primitive Gnostic schools, the Christ also of the dissident priesthood, end quote. So we see from these words that Levi does not consider Baphomet to be a representation of the devil, but rather the sign or symbol of initiation. He equates Baphomet with a force he calls the universal agent and says it is representative of this agent, which he also calls the astral light. He says, quote, there exists in nature a force which is immeasurably more powerful than steam, and a single man who is able to adapt and direct it might change thereby the face of the whole world. This force was known to the ancients. It consists in a universal agent having equilibrium for its supreme law, while its direction is concerned immediately with the great arcanum of transcendental magic. This agent is precisely that which the adepts of the Middle Ages denominated the first matter of the great work. The Gnostics represented it as the fiery body of the Holy Spirit, it was the object of adoration in the secret rites of the Sabbat and the temple, under the hieroglyphic figure of Baphomet or the androgyny of Mendez. Then he goes on to say, In this place let us affirm without evasion that the great magical agent, the double current of light, the living and astral fire of the earth, was represented by the serpent with the head of an ox, goat, or dog in ancient theogenies. It is the dual serpent of the Caduceus, the old serpent of Genesis, but it is also 
the brazen serpent of Moses twined about the tau, that is the generating lingam. It is moreover the goat of the Sabbat and the Baphomet of the Templars. Therefore, again, Baphomet represents the astral light, which is the medium of all magic. The point of the great work is to gain power over this astral light. Levi says that, quote, the great work is, before all things, the creation of man himself, that is to say, the full and entire conquest of his faculties and his future. It is especially the perfect emancipation of his will, assuring him full power over the universal magical agent. Levi uses these words to describe his Baphomet image, quote, the goat which is represented in our frontispiece bears upon its forehead the sign of the pentagram with one point in the ascendant, which is sufficient to distinguish it as a symbol of light. Moreover, the sign of occultism is made with both hands, pointing upward toward the white moon of Chesed and downward to the black moon of Gebera. This sign expresses the perfect concord between mercy and justice. One of the arms is feminine and the other masculine, as in the androgyny of Kunrath, whose at attributes we have combined with those of our goat, since they are one and the same symbol. The torch of intelligence burning between the horns is the magical light of universal equilibrium. It is also a type of the soul exalted above matter, even while cleaving the matter, as the flame cleaves to the torch. The caduceus, which replaces the generative organ, represents eternal life. The scale-covered belly typifies water. The circle above it is the atmosphere. The feathers still higher up signal the volatile. Lastly, humanity is depicted by the two breasts and the androgyny arms of, the, of this sphinx of the occult sciences. The dread Baphomet henceforth, like all monstrous idols, enigmas of antique science and its dreams, is only an innocent and even pious hier hieroglyph. The sign of the pentagram on Baphomet's forehead is a symbol of the astral light. He says this about the nature of the pentagram. Quote, the pentagram signifies the domination of the mind over the elements and the demons of air, the spirits of fire, the phantoms of water and the ghosts of earth are enchained by this sign. Equipped therewith and suitably disposed, you may behold the infinite through the medium of that faculty which is like the soul's eye, and you will be ministered unto by legions of angels and hosts of fiends, end quote. So the soul's eye is the Ajna chakra, or third eye, which allows you to see and interact with the invisible spirits or the angels and fiends of the astral light. This is why the pentagram is placed over the third eye of Baphomet. The torch of intelligence burning above the pentagram corresponds with the crown chakra. So upon close examination, then, we see that Levi's image of Baphomet is not a representation of the Christian devil. It is instead a symbol of the astral light, which is the current of occult force that lies behind all magic work, and it may be used for either good or evil purposes. It is neither good or evil in itself. The controversial British occultist Aleister Crowley believed himself to be Levi's reincarnation. Crowley, born in 1875, the same year that Eliphas Levi died, has been called the wickedest man in the world. He practiced ceremonial magic, was branded as an evil genius, had a problem with drug addiction, and wrote manuals on how to practice tantric sex magic. And more about Elster Crowley in another video. Levi's magic also had a deep impact on the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn and greatly influenced such people as McGregor Mathers, who wrote most of the Order's rituals, and Arthur Edward Waite, who adopted the Baphomet sigil as the devil card in his Rider Waite tarot deck.